Okay. okay, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see such a wonderful crowd here. My name is uh, Jim Antony. I'm a faculty member here at the Institute and director of the Higher Education Program. I'm really happy to do the honor of introducing two amazing people uh, who will be uh, taking the lead on everything that we are doing this afternoon in our conversation together. So obviously the first is our distinguished guest, uh, Eddie Cole. He's visiting us, us this week as the Dean's Distinguished uh, Visiting Fellow uh, here at HGSC. He's going to give us a talk entitled College Presidents and Racial Unrest, a Civil Rights History, which uh, I like to think of as uh, it's a lineaments of what are really the argument of the book that he uh, is producing right now. It's forthcoming volume. He is assistant professor of higher education in the William and Mary School of Education, and also a faculty member in the Lion G. Tyler Department of History there at William and Mary. Uh, as we know, he's a scholar of higher education history, and his approach uh, uh, covers historical material and tries to make connections to the current critical context, uh, and it's garnered praise and respect from academics all over the country. Uh, for example, he's won national awards and honors for his research, most notably in 2017, the Nancy Weiss uh, Malkiel Mal Scholar of the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. In 2015, the National Academy of Education Spencer Education Postdoctoral Fellowship. Uh, he's also received research fellowships and grants from Princeton University, the University of Chicago, and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, prior to coming to William & Mary, where he started in 2013, he was a research project associate for the Indiana University Center for Post-Secondary Research. We're very excited to hear your talk today. It's been great having you here for the last couple of days, and welcome. Thank you. Um, after uh, Eddie's talk, uh, we will have commentary by our very own Dr. John Sylvanus Wilson. Um, and uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Wilson. Uh, as many of you know, President Faust recently announced that he had uh, been appointed as Senior Advisor and Strategist to the President. Do I have the title right? Yeah. Okay, so Senior Advisor <laughs> and Strategist to the President. As the university moves forward in implementing the recommendations of the new Presidential Task Force for Inclusion and Belonging, we all saw the report. Every, every member of this community has seen this very crucial and important report. And his primary responsibility will be to serve as the point person during the Presidential Transition in bringing the Task Force's report to life and ensuring its enduring impact. Uh, Dr. Wilson knows Harvard well. He earned his master's degree at the Harvard Divinity School. Uh, he got a master's degree here at GSC and also got his doctoral degree here at GSC. Um, he's a member of the Board of Overseers, uh, and he will then be uh, taking leave, I assume, yeah. uh, from the Board of Overseers to take on this new role. Is that right? right? Okay, great. And uh, currently this year, we're enjoying his presence here as a president in residence uh, associated with the Harvard Higher Education Program and the rest of GSC. And he's writing a book on the future of higher education with an emphasis on historically black colleges. He's the former president of Morehouse College, the former head of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and a former senior administrator at MIT. Uh, this is an amazing afternoon for us. Uh, thank you all for being here. Let's give our two guests a hand. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Great. Good. Great. Uh, what an honor to be invited here um, to speak with you about my research. And first off, before I get into formal thank yous, um, thank you for sharing your time with me. I really appreciate it. I know everyone has, I know some people in here have actually moved things around to be with me today, so I, I deeply appreciate that. Special thank you to Jim for the invitation and to Dean Ryan um, for this Distinguished Visiting Fellow opportunity, as well as to the Mahondra Humanities Center for co-sponsoring this talk. But before I get into discussing college presidents and racial unrest on the civil rights era, it's important for me to share a little bit about who I am. How did I get to this topic? Why is it important not only to me as a faculty member, but important to me as an individual? So some of you may have heard this, but I grew up in a small town in Alabama called Bology. Anyone ever heard of Bology before this week? <laughs> Maybe not. But Bology has less than 400 people. It is located in the Black Belt, Greene County, Alabama. 
grew up on a family farm there that has been in my family for generations in Bology. But being in a rural black belt, having so few people, my county has one public high school, Green County High, located in Utah. Utah, Alabama, E-U-T-A-W, not E-T-H-A. <clears throat> but if you were to walk out of the back door of my high school and walk past the gymnasium, walk past the baseball field, you come to a street. And on the other side of that street is Warrior Academy. Warrior Academy is a high school, predominantly white. My high school, the public high school, all black and Roman. So from a child, I'd always had these questions around the remnants of the civil rights era as it pertained to education. Now, it wasn't that I was upset about it as a child. It was, this is how things are back home. This was my norm. But I'd always sort of in the back of my mind thinking, well, who made these decisions? Oh, well, all right. <laughs> But going to Green County High School is also very telling because very few college recruiters came to my small, black, rural high school. Very few. Green County High is 30 miles from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. It's not far from the big university, the big flagship. But I can't, I, I, I really have tried to think about this. I don't have a memory of any college recruiters coming 30 minutes down the road to us. I don't have any memories of any brochures from the University of Alabama. In our you know, guidance council office, it's mostly historically black colleges. The Steelman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama State of Montgomery, Alabama A&M, Tuskegee, those institutions. That's who recruited anyone at my high school that was thinking about college. So for me, naturally, being at an all-black high school with a predominantly black teaching force where they, too, were educated at historically black colleges, I went to Tennessee State in Nashville, TSU. The state of Tennessee's only public historically black college. Now, with that said, as an undergraduate student at Tennessee State, the state of Tennessee and the federal courts closed the desegregation case during my lifetime as an undergraduate student, which ultimately the case argued that the state of Tennessee was operating a dual system of higher education. Reader Geyer, a former faculty member at Tennessee State, filed the suit in 1968. And ultimately, the University of Tennessee at Nashville, which you probably have never heard of because it doesn't exist, but the University of Tennessee at Nashville did exist at a moment. And Tennessee State also existed in the city, and the suit argued that why would you establish a predominantly white four-year institution when you have a state-supported four-year institution? It's one of the rare instances to where a historically black college is a surviving institution from a merger after desegregation suit. So Tennessee State University to this day has a downtown campus, which actually is the former University of Tennessee at Nashville. Now, I, I share that personal story just to help you understand how throughout my early academic career, civil rights and education have been intricately linked to everything I know. I've lived this experience, and I've always had questions around, well, who were these academic leaders that we know so, so little about that made these decisions that still have effects today. So I wanted to know more about this long history of civil rights and higher education. And when I discuss higher education during the civil rights era, we usually know things about big moments. So if I said James Meredith in the University of Mississippi, September 1962, we're fairly familiar with the race riot, right? Leaving two people killed, tons of federal marshals injured, Dozens of people, the remnants, tear gas, smoke all over campus, right? But if I asked you who was the chancellor at Ole Miss that was just off to the side of the administration building, could you name him? Okay. What about Alabama? George Wallace, the standing schoolhouse door, June 11, 1963. Governor Wallace, Vivian Malone, James Hood, the two black students enrolled. Who's the president of the University of Alabama, just off to the side? We've seen the photo, but can we name the president? Okay, all right, a third chance. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Greensboro Four, the sit-ins, Greensboro, North Carolina, Woolworths, downtown, historically black college? Who's the president of North Carolina A&T, where those students came from? 
You see my point here. I can do this institution after institution. But in my work, I was curious about well, what role did these academics, academic leaders play in the national conversation around desegregation and civil rights during the early 1960s. And so in my work, with the wonderful support of a number of fellowships, I've been traveling around the country from 2015 to 2017 to nearly 30 different universities trying to answer that question. And so for fun facts, people always ask, where did you go? Well, I'll tell you, right? So after starting in North Carolina with North Carolina a and and trying to understand that, I went to Atlanta. And I first went to Emory and studied Walter Martin at Emory University. Then I went across town to Georgia Tech and studied Edwin Harrison. Then I went over to the AUC, the Atlanta University Center, and studied James P. Brawley, president of Clark College, Benjamin Mays, president of Morehouse, Rufus Clement, president of Atlanta University. Then I went from Atlanta and went to Nashville. Said at Walter S. Davis, president of Tennessee State, my alma mater, as well as Harvey Branscombe and Alexander Hurd, leaders at Vanderbilt University. Flew from Nashville to Syracuse, New York. Did William P. Tolley at Syracuse. Went from Syracuse to Madison, Wisconsin. Did Conrad Elvium and Fred Harvey Harrington at the University of Wisconsin. Then went to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Did Harlan Hatcher. Trying to answer this question. So from Michigan, I went down to Baltimore. Eisenhower, Milton, the brother, was president at Johns Hopkins. Mark Jenkins was president at Morgan State. I took the train from Baltimore up to Philadelphia. Maybe the answer is there. Temple University, University of Pennsylvania. From Philly, I flew to Austin, Texas. Harry Hunt Ransom, University of Texas, Austin. And then from Texas, I went out to the West Coast. Berkeley, Clark Kirk, right? <coughs> J.E. Wallace Sterling at Stanford. Went down to L.A. UCLA, USC, Franklin Murphy, and Norman Topper. Then I came back down south. Okay, let's go back down south. So I get to Memphis, University of Memphis. Get a rental car, drive down to Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson State, Tupelo College, come back up halfway to Oxford. John Davis Williams is the chancellor at Ole Miss. Then I take the rental car over to Tuscaloosa. Frank Rolls is the president at the University of Alabama. Fly to Chicago where there's Lawrence Kipton, who I'll talk about a little bit soon, and then I go over to Princeton, where there's Robert Goheen. You see what I'm doing here, right? It's national in scope. And so how I chose these institutions is also important, because through reading a number of secondary sources, reading books, reading books, a number of institutions always pop up in the civil rights movement. I wanted to go to those institutions, yes. But I also wanted to go to a number of institutions that we don't typically think about when we think about higher education during the civil rights era. There are a lot of small regional colleges where people were confused about what to do as academic leaders at these institutions. So the University of Memphis is a great example. We don't talk about that. Particularly that is located in a city that's 17 to 75% black, but the University of Memphis was all white. So what happens with their civil rights issues? Or Temple University, we don't talk about them quite often. So you see this mix, but overall you get a combination of southern, non-southern institutions, predominantly white and historically black institutions, as well as private and state-supported institutions. Now, with that said, my overall organization of the book works like this. That's a lot of names. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of primary sources, a lot of primary sources. Um, but when you have this many people, what major themes emerge? And so I have organized my book around these big ideas about free speech and civil rights. There's a chapter dedicated to that or how university systems work as it pertains to civil rights. So think about Texas, or New York, or California. What does it mean when an individual chancellor on an individual campus has to answer to someone else who's over the full system? What, when, what happens when they butt heads? That happens in California, by the way. And then I also deal with the bigger issues around housing discrimination and civil rights in college campuses as they expand. I'm definitely going to talk about that today. But you see my larger um, conversation trying to understand the role of college presidents in this big national issue. Now with that said, I'd love to tell you about each of these different 30 institutions, but for the sake of time today, I'll talk about two. Okay? <laughs> All right. So with that said, I want to first start talking about black college, black college presidents, and what I argue is a black college presidential network. Okay? So when we think about black college presidents on the civil rights movement, first thing we think sit-ins black college students in the sit-ins, the lunch counter sit-ins, and 
Ebony Magazine in October 1960 actually has a multi-page feature on the leaders of black colleges in response to the sit-in movement. And the narrative around the black college presidents focuses on by the fall of 1960, more than 100 students are either expelled or suspended from black colleges for participating in sit-ins. The narrative comes down to this major thing. If you were a leader of a private black college, you had more leeway to support the students vocally, which is very important. What do you say publicly during this moment? If you were the leader of a state-supported institution, you didn't say much. You couldn't say much. The segregationist governor or your white board of trustees kept the reins on what you could say. You had to suspend or expel students or condemn the protests at the, at the minimum. That's the dominant narrative around this. But when you're studying something like this across the South, you start to see some nuance within the region. So Martin Jenkins is always intriguing to me at Morgan State in Baltimore. It's upper south. A segregated state, but not quite Alabama, not quite Mississippi, right? And so when I think about Martin Jenkins, it's first worthwhile taking a few seconds to discuss who he is as an individual. So he's born in 1904, born in Terre Haute, Indiana. <laughs> now, Martin Jenkins, born in Terre Haute, Indiana, actually spends um, his elementary and middle school years at a segregated school in Indiana before going on to high school at an integrated, uh, desegregated, I should say, uh, high school in Terre Haute. He leaves Terre Haute and goes to Howard University for undergrad, class of 1925. After finishing up at Howard, he comes back to Terre Haute and works with his dad's contracting company, David Jenkins and Son, Marcus, Marcus and Son. He, while working with his dad contracting company back in Terre Haute, He's working on an associate's degree at the local Indiana State Teachers College, now Indiana State University. He finishes up his associates in 1930. And from there, he goes up to Evanston, Illinois to further his graduate level education and gets a master's in 1933 and his PhD in 1935 from Northwestern. His specialty ends up being a focus on gifted black youth. So black children who scored extremely high on IQ tests that were given at the time. And his academic career, um, he leaves Northwestern and takes on a, a faculty role, um, most of which is at Howard from 1938 to 1948. And then he becomes president at Morgan State in 1948. But as a scholar, I don't think there's any other black college president who published more in the Journal of Negro Education during those first 30 years. The Journal of Negro Education was established in 1932. And if you walk all the way up to the Civil Rights era, uh, no one else publishes more than Martin Jenkins. And he's committed through academic rigor to tearing down this assumption that black youth are intellectually inferior to white youth. And so in 1935, he publishes a study. He publishes a follow-up study in 1939. He published another follow-up study to that in 19. 43. And in the process, his argument ends up being that there are, he estimates, 50 to 75,000 high achieving black youth in America. Yet, by the mid 1940s, only 25,000 students are enrolled at black colleges. So his big question ends up well, where are these high achieving black youth going? This is all important to what he does as president when he gets to Morgan State. So by the time he gets to Morgan State in 1948, he is in the middle of a series of where he publishes annually the enrollment trends at black colleges. In 1938 to 1954, not a year's miss, where Martin Jenkins publishes this in the Journal of Negro Education. And he's deeply interested in his high achieving black youth, as well as what's happening at black colleges. Now, when he's hired in 1948 at Morgan State, it's important because before we get to the Greensboro Forum in 1960, Morgan State students are deeply involved in sit-in resistance as early as 1947 in Baltimore. They've been working with the NAACP. And so from 1947 to 1952, Morgan State students are actively involved in protests at segregated movie theaters. And by 1955, they're protesting at uh, a local ice cream parlor. And by 1959, they successfully protested 
at a local drugstore, and it's lunch counters. Morgan State College, now Morgan State University, has a rich history of student activism that runs parallel to Martin Jenkins and his presidency, which is deeply interesting when we think about the narrative around what it means to be the president of a state-supported institution during this time. Now, when we think about Maryland, it's important to note contextually that there's a governor uh, from 1951 to 1959 that actually supports breaking down a lot of legal laws, I mean, abolishing laws around um, segregation in the state of Maryland. Not to say by any means that the state of Maryland had it figured out in the 1950s and everybody was living in racial harmony. Of course they did. But from a legal standpoint, Maryland is taking steps much more proactive compared to, say, Alabama or Mississippi. Now, with that said, understanding Martin Jenkins, let me get to my notes to quote him. September 28, 1960, Martin Jenkins delivers a fall convocation speech at Morgan State. And this speech is titled, Stand Up. And what he's talking about specifically is the sit-in movement. And so he's very vocal in supporting the students. And he tells the students this, quote, We are witnessing in this country and indeed throughout the world an almost revolutionary movement against racial segregation and discrimination. This movement has many facets. This is a good movement, and it has surprisingly beneficial results. He continued by explaining the significance of the sit-in movement, saying, quote, This is important, but what is more important is that this movement has brought before the people of this nation the fundamental dissatisfaction of young educated students with existing patterns of racial discrimination. President Jenkins made clear the official stance of the college was simple, quote, The participants are citizens who happen to be as well college students. His approach was, you've got the right to protest as an American citizen, you just happen to be enrolled in Morgan State, so therefore, I am going to support you and what you do in your private lives as a citizen. Now, this is all happening in Baltimore, Maryland, as I said, different contextually. But what's most important and what's most telling to the Black College Presidential Network is that roughly two weeks later, he gives his same speech at Fort Valley State College in Fort Valley, Georgia. He goes to Middle Georgia, which is just west of Macon, and says, stand up to the students at Fort Valley State. And ultimately, what I'm working through with this, this idea, with this book, is that you see this network happening in college presidents to where the dominant narrative is, if I were the leader of Fort Valley State as a state-supported black college in Georgia, I said nothing publicly to support the sit-in movement. However, you can call in an outsider from somewhere else to say what you can't say, to say what the governor of Georgia would fire you if not outright close Fort Valley State if the president, Cornelius Trump, said that. But Mark Jenkins came in and he said that. So you see this network happening among black college presidents moving around. Their locations to where they're speaking is so intriguing in this work. And I can't get that piece of Fort Valley State history if not for going to Baltimore and finding even Martin Jenkins' papers. And then when you expand out and think more, uh, you see similar examples of black college presidents speaking at predominantly white universities that are segregated during this time frame. Alfonso Elder, February 25th, 1962. Alfonso Elder is the president of North Carolina Central in Durham. He speaks at nearby Duke University on the sit-ins. You also see the thing, same thing with James P. Brawley, who's the president of Clark College in Atlanta. He speaks at Emory in April 1962. So you see this black college presidential network to where ultimately you see black college presidents willing to sacrifice their personal reputation to where they will go down in history as being quiet and conservative in exchange for perhaps someone else coming in and being able to say what they can't say. All right. But let's move beyond the South and talk a little bit about the second story I want to share. And that's higher education, college presidents, and housing discrimination. And I focus in on the University of Chicago specifically. Now, before I can talk about housing discrimination in Chicago, there's some historical context that's 
we must acknowledge, right? Going back to the 1930s and the New Deal, to where there's funding around mortgages to help people get homes, but at the same time, that opened up the opportunity for discrimination with redlining. So Chicago, and other major cities as well, but Chicago, for the sake of this conversation, redlining ends up being color-coded to where people could, without saying it, um, not give home loans and mortgages to black families and so forth. So we're, we're, we're forming racial segregation. And that moves into racial restrictive covenants that happen in Chicago to where you know, my block will not sell to or rent to a black family uh, and so forth. So you see these things happening in Chicago through the 1930s and 1940s. But what happens when you have restrictive racial covenants when you think about the post-war migration of blacks from the South coming into the Midwest cities like Chicago is that there are only certain parts of Chicago where black Americans can live. Population is increasing. Square mileage is not. So what happens is you see overcrowding. You see the development of slum areas, which it became termed, right? And what happens is in the south side of, south side of Chicago, in Hyde Park, uh, there's Washington Park just to the left, where, you know, where a lot of, <laughs> where a lot of black families could live, and then Woodlawn just in the south. And so what happens is there becomes this physical spillover that's getting too close to the University of Chicago. So enter Lawrence Kipton, who is the chancellor at the University of Chicago uh, in 1952. And he's deeply worried about this encroaching black slum in Chicago. But within that, he knows that this isn't just a local problem. So he calls up his fellow presidential friends at other big urban universities. And in 1957, there's a meeting between Chancellor Lawrence Kipton at Chicago, Nathan Pusey here at Harvard, MIT's president, Yale's president, and the president of the University of Pennsylvania. Right? They have a meeting, and they all come together and they decide that there are three issues that they all have in common. When there's student enrollment, there's concern about being able to attract certain students to their campuses when they um, could go to suburban or more rural campuses, not near the urban issues that are unfolding in the 1950s and going into the 1960s. They're also deeply concerned about recruitment and retention of faculty who don't want to work and live in these areas. And then the final thing is property values, real estate interests, what's happening to university property. Now, but it's after this meeting with these five presidents, it spreads quickly. And soon, uh, administrators at New York University are considering buying property in Washington Square. You've got campus officials at Temple University immediately buy 40 acres and they look to purchase more. You've got the same thing happening at the University of Pennsylvania. Yale administrators joined the Urban Renewal Program in New Haven. All the while, Harvard leaders look to, quote, Reestablish friendly relations, end quote, with Cambridge. <laughs> Sounds familiar, huh? Uh, in the end, eventually we have 16 universities involved in urban renewal initiatives following the University of Chicago's lead. Ultimately, uh, what we see here, and it wasn't what I was looking for, but the archival evidence emerged and became a story for me, that the college presidency in the civil rights era is as deeply involved with responding to student protests, as we see with black colleges in the South, as they are with understanding the growth of the university and housing discrimination, one of our largest civil rights issues of that time. Now, with that said, the University of Chicago story um, ends up being one that's deeply related to civil rights and public relations. Uh, but before getting into that, uh, this public relations aspect, um, the marketing of joining the Urban Renewal Initiative, Lawrence Kipton at Chicago became deeply interested in ultimately positioning the University of Chicago as a leader in saving our cities. But when focused on the public relations push, Lawrence Kipton did not listen to local concerns. For instance, in 1958, Chicago Urban League President Nathaniel Calloway questioned the contradictory nature of the University of Chicago and its urban renewal plans. He says, quote, it's not that we don't want some clump, it's not that we don't want slum clearance. Decaying areas and outmoded streets must be rebuilt. But can we in justice 
tear down people's homes when we continue to restrict their free movement into new homes. In other words, can slum clearance and the perpetuation of residential segregation live together? That succinctly summarizes the concerns of local Southside residents with the University of Chicago's aggressive involvement with urban renewal initiatives. But in response, Lawrence Kipton moved forward with the publicity of look at what the University of Chicago is doing to save American <coughs> students. In response, uh, Chicago officials ended up testifying before a Senate subcommittee at one point on behalf of a number of institutions in America. The University of Louisville is represented by Chicago. Seattle University is represented by Chicago. And the argument is that the federal government is lenient and actually give credit to universities for the amount of money they've already put into urban renewal initiatives. So by, night, by November 1959, the University of Chicago had coordinated a citywide effort toward $135 million in federal, private, and university funds to renew the South Side of Chicago. And by January 1960, that total was up to $195 million. I had a student in class last week do the inflation um, numbers on that, and that's $1.4 billion today. If a university was involved with anything today that had $1.4 billion on it, that would be of great interest, just as, <laughs> just as it was back then. So the University of Chicago, uh, this, this story is deeply related to public relations because when you get into those files, you look at Carl Larson, who was the director of public relations for the University of Chicago, as the New York Times is starting to cover the university, U.S. News and World Reports, he writes to NBC. He said, well, we should also have television exposure for what we're doing to save Chicago as well. And he writes, quote, I would like to propose that the story of the University of Chicago's fight against blight might be a dramatic one for you to tell. We are engaged with the aid of the city administration in an urban renewal program that has been widely held as one of the most imaginative in the nation. Gener generously, after stating that Columbia, Yale, and, quote, other leading universities would also be interested, he continued making this pitch to NBC, saying, quote, it provides evidence, I believe, that there is an exciting photogenic story of significance in what is happening in and to the American city. This is relevant as it continues um, because Chancellor Skipton, overall, his rationale behind this was, quote, we are fighting for our lives. We simply cannot operate in slums. The Chancellor of the University of Chicago. Now, Chancellor Kipton retires in 1960, at the end of the calendar year, in the middle of the academic year. And he rides off into the sunset. The narrative around his chancellorship is quite positive. He's celebrated for what he has done to lead the University of Chicago and other universities toward his involvement within urban renewal um, in Chicago and elsewhere. But as he retires, and which is very telling of the college presidency, there's this transition point when you're changing academic leaders. That's also important. And he hired George Beadle, who's a scientist, and he comes in from Caltech. He moves to Chicago in January of all months. <laughs> um, and he arrives, and he's committed to simply continuing what Lawrence Kipton has done. <coughs> but something important happens in this social this moment. The 1950s, you can't transition into, into the 1960s without acknowledging what's happening in the South. By 1960, we have the lunch counter scene. By 1961, when George Beale arrives, we're getting ready for the Freedom Rides, so forth. What a lot of black student activists and black colleges in the South do, they actually go on a speaking tour very early in the 1960s that we don't talk about quite often. I think about the, the Stevens sisters from Florida a and and several others, right? They go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They go to the University of Michigan. They go to the University of Chicago. And they speak on these campuses about what's happening in the South. One of my greatest... Um, most appreciative archival finds is seeing this quote from a student from Fisk University speaking in Madison, Wisconsin. And the Madison students ask her, what can we do to support the Southern sit-in movement? And her response is, the greatest thing you can do to support us is to fight your local racial discrimination. 
That message is delivered across these big universities in the Northeast and in the Midwest. So immediately, as George Beadle arrives, there's an awakening, if you will, among the University of Chicago students. Um, Leonard Friedman, who leads the student movement at Chicago, as well as another student we may have heard of, Bernie Sanders, um, emerges at Chicago, and they start to question the University of Chicago administration under George Beadle. And what they've noticed is that in the process of buying up property in the 1950s, the University of Chicago has not required those local property managers to change their seg segregationist practices. So there's still segregation in rental properties and home ownership in the south side of Chicago, but the property itself is owned by the University of Chicago now. So the University of Chicago is operating segregated, segregated housing. Students notice this, and they immediately, they run the test. They do the send in the white student to ask for a rental property, send in the black student to ask for a rental property. Black students deny it, we don't have any space. White students given a key almost immediately, right? And so they take this evidence, these notarized statements, and send it to the president, George Beadle, and say, well, what are we going to do about this? George Beadle's response is, this is a problem, but we don't plan to own the property forever, so we don't want to disrupt the neighborhood. So if you could just give us some patience until we sell the property off or whatever's going to happen with it, we won't have this problem tied to the University of Chicago. Well, when students in the South are losing their lives over civil rights issues, fighting for civil rights, students at Chicago don't have the patience to say, let's wait a few more years on the University of Chicago to gradually change. So in January 1962, after giving President Beadle a week to respond, and not being pleased with that response, there's a sit-in in the president's office. Historically, it ends up being the first sit-in north of the Mason-Dixon line organized by CORE, the University of Chicago CORE chapter. Now, Velma Hill, um, who is from the National Office of CORE, comes to Chicago, and there's a rally outside the president's office, January 1962, and she has this quote that says, the octopus in the south has tentacles in the north. And that's the rallying point. And from outside of the administration building, they go in, they go up to the fifth floor, and they start a sit-in in the president's office. The sit-in goes on for three weeks. In week two, George Beadle, the president, goes back to California. Fundraising trip. Maybe I'll get away from it while the president's office is occupied. What was really interesting, I talked about black college presidential networks, which was really interesting, think about student activist networks. When he gets to the Fairmont Hotel, downtown San Francisco, guess who's waiting on him? <laughs> about three dozen student protesters from Cal Berkeley who have been in touch with their student friends in Chicago. He can't get away from it. <laughs> he's run out of property. He's like he's, he can't go any farther west. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, this pressure continues, and what the sit-in off, what the sit-in does, which is probably really interesting to you all, deeply invested in that administrative leadership, is that it changes the public relations narrative around the University of Chicago. All of a sudden, those same publications, the New York Times, U.S. News, World Report, Newsweek, NBC, are still covering the University of Chicago, but now covering it as an institution that's practicing housing discrimination, that supports housing discrimination. So he comes back from California, cuts the, cuts the trip short, um, and returns to Chicago, and then there's a different conversation. What can we do immediately to change what we're doing as a practice, as an institution. So after a lot of pressure, most relevant to all of this is that when the Board of Trustees get involved at the University of Chicago, then policy changes. So in April 1962, the trustees officially passed a resolution that outlawed all forms of segregation, discrimination at the University of Chicago, not just in enrollment, because initially Beatles said, well, look at our history. We've always enrolled black students at the University of Chicago. You can go down the list, right? So Carter G. Woodson, Benjamin Mays, and these black intellectuals from the early 19, 
early 1900s. All these people had gone to the University of Chicago at some point, right? So clearly we can't be racist. But in reality, the off-campus aspect brought the university and higher education closer to the civil rights movement. Now with that said, um, what does that mean today? So to my two points, because the title of my talk, I mean some of you may be here just to support me, but the title is also, this is relevance, the timeliness to what we deal with today. So when I think about black college presidential networks, and then I look at the role of the black college president today, it's worth taking this history and unpacking it a bit and saying, well, what does this mean when we look at this photo, which was highly controversial, black college presidents meeting with <coughs> Donald Trump, and people were immediately, how could you dare go meet with Donald Trump? How could you? Someone who has been vocally against something like Black Lives Matter, which is tied deep into the ethos of a lot of black colleges. It seems contradictory. But when we think about historically these black college presidents networks and how black college presidents have had to operate within this white structure, this white power structure, what's happening here may not be as easy to critique as we think. And then when we think about housing discrimination, present day issues, this is from a month ago, Greenville, South Carolina, a headline. This resonates and sort of brings it full circle to my own personal story that I opened up with because Clemson, South Carolina, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a small town. It's a big university, but a very small town. And as Clemson University has continued to grow as an institution, rural Americans, now 50 years later, not think about urban America, but rural Americans like where I grew up in Bolivia, Alabama, are now feeling the pressure of a university growing into where they live for generations. And so the relevance, the timeliness, thinking about the role of the college president in university growth and its relationship with its local commun community, whether urban or rural, is very important. Something for us to continue to think about. So those are just two big highlights I want us to, I wanted to share today. We can discuss any aspect of the book at large. But before I um, wrap up my comments, I have to give some acknowledgments because Traveling around to nearly 30 universities takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to fly all over the country, a lot of hotel rooms, but I'd be uh, remiss if I did not acknowledge the generous support of the National Academy of Education, the Spencer Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, Princeton University, University of Chicago, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison for <coughs> their generous support in helping me explore this big idea around the role of the college presidency and racial unrest for civil rights history. Thank you.